Praise today. He is so worthy. All throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring, and every season from where I'm standing. Help me. 
cross. You see the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. You see the cross, the empty grave, the evidence is endless. All my sin rolled away because of you. your Bible to Matthew chapter 27 or look on your pad Matthew 27 you're going to know this story it's a story about a man named Pilate and his interaction with Jesus and in this story you're going to hear Pilate ask six questions he's going to ask six questions and, and one of those questions we're going to center on for what we'll hear the Lord say to us today and here's where I am I'm a person who asks a lot of questions my wife tells me all the time, you ask too many questions to people. She said, when you meet them, you just start asking them questions. I'm like, well, how am I ever going to know? How am I going to know things if I don't ask them questions? So I ask questions. So this past Friday, uh, I was with my dad. We're, we're at his house, and the home health people came to do an assessment for his physical therapy. And this young man comes in. I figure he must be 25 years old. And you can just tell that he's not you know, local to Albertville. So he has quite an accent, and I'm watching him work, and I'm trying to learn this fact, because when medical personnel are working on you or working with your family, it's better to not try to carry on a conversation with them. It's just hard, because I know in trying to do a few things myself, when people talk to me, I tend to lose my attention, you know? So anyway, about the time this young fellow finished up, you know, I asked him, and I said, hey, uh, I said, hey, just, just curious, man, what's your name? Because I, I would, wanted to be able to talk to him. And he looked at me and he said, Christian. And I said, man, that's an awesome name. I said, so are you one? And he just looked at me kind of surprised. And he said, huh? I said, your name's Christian. Are you one? And he goes, oh, yeah, I, I am. He said, I just moved here from the Philippines. He said, I was a nurse over there. It worked out for me to get a work visa. I'm here working for Marshall Home Health for two years under this work visa. And he told me all about his faith. He grew up in a Christian school in, in the Philippines. So he went four-year-olds through high school in a Christian school. So he said, I learned a lot about Jesus. And I said, well, that's, that's awesome. You know, we need to, to learn a lot about Jesus. Now, I just say that to say this. It's fun just to be able to get to know people and to talk to people and ask them questions because of what might come out of that. Okay, so Jesus is going to meet with Pilate. I don't think they've ever met before. I'm sure Pilate knew who Jesus was. I'm pretty sure he had heard of him quite often. But he's going to meet him face to face. And they're going to have some conversation. And Pilate's going to turn that conversation. And he's going to ask some questions to some other people. So just to set that up, I want you to think about this with me. The Lord's Supper had already been taken. The disciples had moved out to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. They were there praying when Judas comes with the, the guards to arrest Jesus. Jesus is arrested, taken to the Jewish leadership first. They decide, we're going to take this thing to Pilate because he's the leader of Rome and he can get him killed. <laughs> we want him killed 
and we want him killed now. They wanted rid of Jesus once and for all. So they parade Jesus early morning hours of this day. I mean, daybreak probably early. They go to Pilate's home, the Praetorium, where the leader of the Roman government, who was the governor over, uh, for Rome over this area, so that he can listen to Jesus and hopefully bring a sentence of guilty and have him crucified. So that's where the conversation picks up in verse 11 of chapter 27. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor questioned him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and the elders, he did not answer. That's Jesus. As the chief priests and the elders were accusing him of saying many things about him, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, to Jesus, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? And he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. Now, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the people any one prisoner whom they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that because of envy, they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to put Jesus to death. But the governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, and here is the question I want to think about today. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, crucify him. And he said, what evil has he done? They kept shouting out all the more, saying, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he had accomplished nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, his blood shall be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas for them. And after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, that we can read it this morning, God, that we can have faith, we can understand it, we can know, and we can hear the questions, God, that Jesus was asked, Lord, on the day that he's going to be crucified. And we can understand a little bit about where he is, where Pilate is, where the people were. And God, I pray right now for us, may you bring our attention all into focus on this place where we can understand this question that Pilate asked, what shall I do with Jesus? I pray, God, that our hearts will be moved today, that we will hear you, that we will hear you speak, and we'll know clearly what it is that you're trying to say to us as we see these questions. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, in about the early 1900s, our former president, Ronald Reagan, was born. And when he was just a boy, it was kind of an interesting story, his aunt carried him out one day to buy him some new shoes. And back in those days, you went to a cobbler and they actually made your shoes to fit your feet. So you're talking about, it's about 19 and 15, 16, 17, right through there, a long time ago. And so when he goes in, he gets fitted, and the guy asked him, he said, uh, hey, Miss, uh, he just called him Ronnie. He said, Ronnie, when do you want to, what kind of shoes you want? Do you want square-toed? Or do you want round toed? And he said, I, I don't know. I just, I can't, I, I can't decide. Let me think about it. I'll just make a decision. So <laughs> he left and went about for three days. The guy didn't ever hear from him. So one day he saw him walking down the street. About three days later, he stepped out of the shop. And he said, Ronnie, how do you want your shoes? You want square toed or do you want round toed? And he says, I don't know. I, I just, I can't make up my mind. He said, I tell you what, they'll be ready on Friday. Come by and pick them up. So he went by on Friday, and he picked him up. And you know what he got? He got one square toed, and he got one round toed. And here's what Ronald Reagan said after that. And it was kind of cool. He told this while he was president of the United States. He said, I learned something. You better make decisions for yourself, or somebody else are going to make them, and you may not like what you get. So you think about that for us, because we have to make our decisions. God calls us to hear truth 
and make decisions. We have to make decisions. Sometimes we may not want to make a decision. And this that I just read to you, Pilate, just flat out does not want to make this decision. He don't want to make the decision. He don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. But he comes to this place with this question where he says to him, what shall I do with Christ? So I wanted you to think about that with me and kind of look at this. Three, three things concerning Pilate's question, what shall I do with Jesus? And, and here's just the first thing as we begin just to look into verse 22. And we're going to break this out and we're going to look at all these verses and compass these as much as possible into this one question. In verse 22, when he said, Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Now, here's what I wanted to tell you. First off, this is a personal question. It's personal because what he said, what shall I do? He didn't say in this moment, what shall we do? Oh, what shall they do? He said, what shall I do? And it's pretty interesting he began to look at that because he understood something in that moment. There was a place cast on him where he was going to have to make a decision. It was a personal decision. It affected him. It affected a lot of people. But he said, what shall I do? Because it was on him. Here's what I wanted to tell you, and I want you to grasp this for us. Every one of us in this room, every one of us who's born on this earth, someday in some way are called upon to make a personal decision decision about Christ. We make a personal decision. And here's the thing, you can't leave that up to somebody else. You can't even wish that on somebody else. You can't even try to put that on somebody else because here's what I wanted to tell you, and you want to get this, we don't understand, it's a personal decision. He said that, what shall I do? So he understood that and he had to come to that place. Now looking at that, I want you to get some of the information that's coming to him to try to make the decision with. I want you to understand that. First off, he has standing in front of him, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh, whom Jesus said of, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So standing in front of Pilate is the truth, all truth, the source of truth, the one who is the truth is standing in front of him. And Pilate is seeking here to know some truth. He's wanting to know that. Now over in John, it even tells us that when he's asking about Jesus told him a statement about truth, and Pilate said, what is the truth? So he has standing before him Jesus, and he looked at Jesus, and, and here's what's interesting. Jesus would not even defend himself. When they're slinging accusations at him, he won't even defend himself. And Pilate even looks and goes, hey, do you hear what they're saying about you? Are you not going to say anything? And you know what? Jesus never said a word. So all of a sudden, Pilate is looking at him, trying to discern something, understand something. And here's what it says in there. In, in, in one of the verses we read, I think it's about uh, uh, around there, 13 or 14, right through there. It says that uh, he was amazed. Pilate was amazed that Jesus did not defend himself. Who in the world would not defend themselves against that? I want to tell you something. <laughs> it is somebody. Who knows the plan of God? Because I want to tell you something in this moment, and this is awesome to me. Jesus didn't need to defend himself. He didn't have to defend himself. He didn't even want to defend himself because he knew what the moment held. He understood in this moment that he was come to this place for this place, for this time, for this purpose, and that was to die on the Roman cross, to shed his blood for the sin of man. He knows that. He knows that so much in the moment. He don't even feel like he needs to defend himself. And so Pilate is looking at him, trying to understand something, and Pilate goes, that guy amazes me. It's one of those things where I don't even know what it is. You ever seen that where people you just go, I don't, I don't get you. I don't even understand it. But I love it when people who are not Christians meet people who are Christians and they're really walking in the presence of God and they go, man, I don't even understand you. I don't even get it. But I would like to be kind of like you are. I would like to know how you can be like you are. That's how Pilate found Jesus. I don't get you. I don't understand you. But hey, I'm amazed by who you are. You're standing here before us. And then in verse 19, there's his wife. He has his wife. And here's what she says. While he's sitting on the judgment seat, and picture this, Christ is before him. There are all these people around accusing him. Somebody comes and brings him a note from his wife, and it says this. Have nothing to do with that man. Have nothing to do with that righteous man. Because I suffered greatly in a dream last night. I wanted to know what that meant when she said suffered greatly in a dream. So I understand that word. And to understand that word, it means this. I was affected greatly by. 
That's what it means. I was affected greatly by an experience of this man in my dream last night. So I understand something. She knew something. She knew he was a righteous man. She understood that he was right, that he was righteous, that he was right with God, he was righteous. And she sends Pilate that message, and she says, understand this, I want you to know something, don't do anything against him. Because all of a sudden, she had some information that he didn't even have in the moment, even though he was standing there in the midst of that truth. So he's looking at that. And then there's the crowd. Verses 20 and 21, and the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas to put Jesus to death. And the governor said, which one do you want me to release? And they all said, Barabbas. And then again in verse 24, and Pilate saw the, uh, when he was accomplishing nothing but that a riot was starting. He took the water basin, he washed his hands of it, and said, I'm innocent of this man's blood. So all of a sudden... He's got a, cl- a crowd of people clamoring in his ear, and they're saying, crucify him, crucify him. And his wife's saying, don't mess with him, don't mess with him over here. And Jesus is just standing there being quiet. <laughs> Jesus is just standing there being who Jesus is here to be. And I believe this, calm and collected as you could possibly be. And I can just imagine Pilate's heart was racing, and he's trying to come up with, with some kind of a decision. What? shall I do with Christ? Does anybody remember that moment? Do you remember the moment when all of a sudden you were confronted with the truth? I mean, the truth of, of your salvation, the truth that the fact of the, of the matter is that you knew in a moment that you were lost and you realized your state of lostness and all of a sudden you realize in that and this overwhelming sense of, oh, and, and your heart beats fast and your palms get sweaty and you go, what am I going to do? In this moment, does anybody remember that? Have you been safe so long (laughs) that you just forgot? You forgot this moment when you had to make a personal decision about Christ. I'm going to tell you something. I believe this. Salvation for us is a personal thing we do between us and God. We shouldn't listen to our wife. We shouldn't listen to a clamoring crowd. We shouldn't listen to anybody else. But hear this. The Spirit of God, through the person of Jesus Christ, will speak into your heart. He will let you know the state of who you are. And there is a personal decision that has to be made that is yours. That you own it. That it's yours. That you make it. That you know in a moment of time you've made this decision. You understand that. Today, many of us face same issues in life. We have personal decisions we may need to make. And there's things before us every day, even as saved people, where we have to make decisions every day. And we have to take into account, we should, what shall I do? What is my personal place in this moment with the decisions I need to make concerning Christ? What shall I do? Here's my point to you in that. Don't let anybody else mess with your decision between you and God. You know what it is. You make it. You live with it. You walk in it. And you be confident that you know this. And here's what I believe in this moment. Jesus knew the plan. Karen and I talked about this earlier. I said, I feel like I don't always know the plan. You know what I mean? I wish I, wish I did know the plan. The, the grand plan, so to speak. Then I can make a decision over here, over here. I don't know the grand plan. But I know this. In the moment, the Spirit of God brings the discernment to me in a moment to make the decision I need to make for this moment, for this day. And every decision that runs through my mind for what I do, what I think, where I be, everything needs to come through the place. What shall I do with Jesus? Because it all boils down to me understanding who He is what he is, where he is, and what he's wanting to do in a particular life on a particular moment. So there we see this place. I love this thing. It was a personal, a personal decision which he had to make. And then he says it a little further. What shall I do? The question was one that demands action. Do. 
do. I mean, that means, that's interesting. I, I wanted to understand that word as well. And it means to do something. It, it means to take action. It means to go forward into something. To do something is an action kind of word. So Pilate understand it's a personal thing. But here's the thing. I have to do something with this information that I've been given. I have to do something. And, and here's what I'm going to tell you. As we get, and here's my word, confronted in my terms, sometimes I, I use this word, and not a very good word in our culture anymore, accosted by the truth of God. When God's truth brings this place upon me, and I know something, and I have to move that. Here's what, God never brings me things that don't require of me action. Do you understand that? When God speaks to me, it's not for me just to go, oh man, this is so good. This is good. Oh, I'm just in a state of bliss. Heavenly bliss, thank the Lord. When God speaks, he always calls people to action. He calls them to response. So here, here's what Pilate's got to do. Pilate's got to act. Pilate's got to do something. He's in this moment. And I'm going to tell you something for us. We need to understand this place of, of responding and, and knowing what it is we need to do. So Pilate's mind is spinning. I'm going to tell you, Pilate's mind is spinning 90 miles an hour. He's trying to think about what is it? What, what shall I personally, what shall I do? And here's what he comes up with. Here's what he thinks. I know Barabbas is like the meanest dude ever. He is in prison for insurrection against the government. It was very legitimate. He was a murderer and he was a robber. I will offer them the worst guy ever to get out or I'll offer them Jesus. And I know why Jesus is here. It's a cool verse. Looks to what he says there. Looks. I keep saying looks. Look is not plural. I'm sorry. Verse 18. For he knew that because of envy they had handed him over. So here's some action. Here's what he's doing. He's thinking they're just envious of Jesus. Envy means this. I'm, I want to just give you a description of what this means because this is powerful right here. Envy, a feeling of discontentedness or, or resentful longing over someone's possessions, success, or qualities. So in other words, these Jewish leaders were envious. They were jealous of Jesus' place with the people. They were jealous of his ability to do miracles his abilities to speak truth. They were jealous of that. And they felt like he was disrupting their apple cart. So they just thought they would get rid of him. And in, in uh, Pilate's mind, he goes, well, who would they take? This guy who they're just envious and jealous of or a robber, a thief, an insurrectionist. That's an easy one, right? That's an easy one. So he's thinking of these things. So when he puts that before him, again, they respond. They respond and they respond with this place of Barabbas. What does Pilate want to do in that moment? And we read that a minute ago. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather than a riot was starting, he took a water basin and washed his hands in front of the crowd. In other words, he washes his hands and he says, I might have anything to do with this. I just not have anything to do with it. You know what? He couldn't not have anything to do with it. He couldn't. To get this. In this moment of decision that he had to make, it's the same moment of decision sometimes we have to make. There's things we just want to go, I just want to wash my hands of that. I don't have anything to do with that. And it's like, because of where God has placed you, where God has put you, where God has positioned you, there's decisions you need to make that's godly decisions, that is right decisions, that you need to know that. And you can't just go, I don't want to make that decision. I'm just going to wash my hands of it and let somebody else worry about it. Because there's a place where he's put you in your particular place and time to be there, to be what he has for you to be. So you look at that and you think about that. That's interesting to me. The question in which we all must ask, and we all must decide, will we decide to receive him? Or reject him? Will we decide to obey him or disobey him? Will we decide to openly confess him or to deny him? Will you make him Lord of your life or will you slight him? Will you worship him with all of your heart or will you just kind of go through the motion today? See, there is a decision to be made all along the day in every one of our lives. And what are we going to, and here's the thing, do what are we going to do 
with what we know. And there's a word for that. It's called faith. What we do with what we know brings about for us a place called faith. The question that Pilate asked demanded action. In this case, it demanded his action. And here's the last part of that. It's a question simply about Jesus. Get it? This is cool. Listen to that verse again. Then what shall I do personally? What shall I personally act upon? What shall I do with Jesus? The question, this question dwarfed everything in Pilate's life. Everything else in this moment, I want you to understand this, it didn't even matter. Nothing else mattered in that moment in his life because he said, what shall I do with Jesus? Because before him is the Christ and he has to make a decision about him in that moment. And, and he don't want to make that decision. He wants to wash his hands of that decision. But sh what shall I do about Jesus? Now, here's what I want to say about that. And it's very simple. Everything we do, everything we do, and everything we should do is about one thing. It's about Jesus. I want you to get that in your mind because, because we get confused on that. Jesus is God's son. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is the one who died on the cross for our sin. He is the one who was resurrected from the grave. He is the one who brings us salvation. He is the one who's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. He is the one who's going to come back and take his church all to glory. Everything we do, we have, we are, is about him. But if you listen to church, it's not about church. It's not about a religious service. It's not about a style of music. It's not about a style of preaching or a person that you may like more than another person. We all get hung up on these things. It's not about I like or I don't like a stylistic music. I don't or I don't like, you know, a version of the Bible. Listen, the question that Pilate had before him is what am I going to do with Jesus we need to hear that and we need to know that. That needs to be a driving factor in everything that we process, that we think about, that we do. Because if we're not careful, we can, get all, we can get all worked up and we can get all envious and we can think about all kinds of things and we lose sight. Very simply, there is a personal decision that has to be made concerning your soul, concerning the salvation of your soul. When you hear the truth, it demands an action. It demands an action. I want you to understand that's not something you can or should wash your hands of or think you don't have anything to do with because that is something we should know and own. And I'm going to tell you something. If we can get this place right in our minds with every decision that we make, we can understand something. We're either glorifying Christ in our decisions or we are not. We're either lifting up the kingdom of God or we are not. We're either tearing down people and building up some people or we're trying to promote the kingdom of God. When we can get our focus on that, all of a sudden things can change. So I read this story earlier and I had read this before. It, came, it comes from a book titled Between Two Truths, Living with Biblical Tension, written by a guy named Kyle Snodgrass. Cool story. During World War II, Winston Churchill was forced to make a painful choice. The British Secret Service had broken the Nazis' code and informed Churchill that the Germans were going to bomb a town called Coventry. He had two alternatives. He had two decisions. Evacuate the citizens and save hundreds of lives at the expense of indicating to the Germans that he's broken their code. Or take no action which would kill hundreds of people but keep the information flowing and possibly save many lives and help win the war, what do you think he did? He had to choose. And he chose not to expose the truth he knew. And because of that, that city got bombed and hundreds of people died. But on the flip side of that, because of that, they were able to intercept all of the information the Nazis were doing, and it helped them ultimately win the war. 
Jesus is standing before Pilate. And Jesus knows what's coming on Friday and what's coming on Sunday. And he also knows what's coming 40 days, 50 days later when the church is born and Peter preaches at Pentecost and thousands of people are saved in that moment. He knows that truth. And in his mind, he knows for him. So he don't feel the need to defend himself because he knows where he is in the moment. Pilate grapples with the issue. But here's what I want you to know in all of that. God always has the plan. God has the plan. He's trying to lead you to the plan. He's leading you to the plan. I'm going to tell you something. The decisions you make are important. They're important in helping you walk that path to what God's plan is for you. I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes for us, that means keep your mouth shut. Okay? And, and go with where God's taking you. And everybody goes, well, that ain't fair. You know what Jesus could have said? This ain't very fair. This ain't very good at all. But he knew there was a greater plan at work. I want to tell you something. There's a greater plan at work in you than you know. There's a greater plan. You don't understand what's going on in the very moment. Because it looks cloudy from where you are. Because you can't see down the road a ways. But God is saying, there's a plan. And I'm working this plan. And I want you to understand this plan. And it may be time for you just to be quiet. And follow where I'm taking you. Okay? And he may be calling you to step out and take some action that's beyond you. And he wanted you to understand this question. What shall I do with Christ? What shall I do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? And that means maybe the plan is for you today to understand this. You need saved. You're lost. You're lost and you don't even uh, acknowledge it. You don't understand it. You don't grasp it. And he's saying to you, what are you going to do? It's a personal call. What are you going to do today? What action are you going to take? And listen. Don't let anybody else mess with your decision. God and God alone will bring you to the decision you need to make. What shall I do with Jesus?